Okay, and we are live. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Finnable webinar on Land Forces Modernization. Uh, my name is Anarita Silveri and I work at the Communications and Public Relations Department at Finnable. It is now is 2 uh, p.m. and here in Brussels is sort of a sunny afternoon, which is always nice to see. Before we start, I will do a very quick round of greetings to greet our honourable guest speakers who have joined us this afternoon. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Ben Berry, Senior Fellow of Land Warfare at IISS, the International Institute of Strategic Studies. Good afternoon and thank you for being with us. Additionally, we have uh, Mr. Mark Essig, International Councillor and former Chairman and CEO of Thales Greece. And last but not least, of course, we have, it is my pleasure to have with us this afternoon, Major General Carl Angle Grexton, uh, who will be giving uh, his opening speech in just a moment. I would like you to introduce him to the, to the audience. Uh, Major General Colin Brexton is the commander of the Swedish Army and between 2014 and 2016 he was the head of training and education of the Swedish Armed Forces. Before that he was chairman of the NATO Connecting Forces Initiative between 2013 and 2014. He's recognized for his in-depth knowledge of security policy, international relations, management and leadership. And lastly, he's a co-author of the book, and I'm going to quote the title here, In Business and Battle, Strategic Leadership in the Civilian and Military Spheres. Now, Major General, I'm going to leave the floor to you for your present, for your opening speech. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be with you today. And, uh, I'm uh, sending from uh, up north of Sweden, where we have a brigade exercise. Uh, where we right now in the back of me, you will see uh, our semi automized artillery battalion that is uh, supporting live uh, brigade exercise. So, uh, in the uh, right of uh, 40 or 50 kilometers away from here, they will soon deliver their ammunition. And I'm brought in to speak about the army modernization. Now, I will do that by presenting. have been uh, communicating this strategy for quite a long time, four years to be exactly, and uh, in this year, in January, the Swedish government has uh, decided a new defence bill. And the defence bill, in short, is presented as an army defence bill. So I will bring you through that, and that is my way of representing uh, what I think can be some sort of guidance for army modernization for the future. So the acronym for this modernization is three letters, remembered by a special forces operation. It's an S, it's an F, and it's an O. Each letter represents five years. So the first year and the S is the structure that we are now embarking in this new defense bill to build the structure into 2025. The next coming years, we will focus on the functions of war, not only the maneuver brigades, but the functions within the brigades and within the division. And for the five years after that, beyond 30, is to replace obsolescent material, primarily the replacement of today's infantry fighting vehicle and tanks. So I start with the first five years. And that is the organizational point of army modernization. I think that most of the armies today struggle with the fact that we come from a period of um, international operations, stabilization operations, whilst now the task is to fight a near peer adversary, high qualified trained and in big formations. So it means that the structure we are now regaining from basically a battalion based army is to go back to a brigade-based army within the division. So we are in this uh, defense bill tasked to set up the structure for three brigades, two brigade battle groups and one division. And that is because of the geography of Sweden. So we will have one brigade up in the north where I'm now, specially designed for this Arctic warfare climate, and one in the center and one in the south. 
Sweden is geographically a large country. The size of Sweden, if you turn it upside down, goes from northern Poland to southern Italy. It means that we need to have the strategic mobility within the country. And we need also to be able to fight in different type of terrains and climate. And the two other battle groups, one is for uh, the uh, defending the capital of Stockholm and one is for the island of Gotland. So it's three plus two and then plus one division with special divisional assets as artillery. And if you're lucky, you might be able to see some of it behind me right now. Um, and so the motto for the first five years is three plus two plus one. We are also lucky in this defense bill that we need to grow, not only by regaining the brigade structure. And the brigade structure is all the functions of war within the brigade. So we are ready to fight in the air, on the ground, and bring all the assets with us. We are coming from a time where the troops have been deployed and mainly performed a one-dimensional uh, war fighting skill because we have not been threatened from the air and we have not been put out to be suppressed by so much of artillery. That is what an air pair adversary will be able to throw at us. So this is why we are regaining this structure and training the officer corps to be able to handle big unit maneuvers again. So right now, as I said, I'm up visiting a brigade exercise in the northern climate to Sweden. So the first five years is the structure three plus two plus one. The next five years we will focus on uh, bringing in the functions of war on the divisional level, such as logistics, more artillery, long range um, firing capacity within the artillery, air defense, ground-based air defense. We are already from this year we have uh, the um, uh, operational capability of, uh, of, of the Patriot system. And we are bringing also the, the divisional assets of uh, engineers, artillery and reconnaissance. And then for the future, we are trying to get into the next replacement of, of the tank. And that is one of the main struggles that we have now. What is the replacement of today's tank system? We know that the enemy has advanced tank systems. We don't really know what will be the replacement for our tank systems. We hope to be able to cooperate together with uh, France and UK and France and Germany in their uh, program for that. And we are happy to be uh, announced as observers in the main ground systems future. So in short, I think we have to grow in numbers and in organization, and we need it, we need to bring in the technical aspects of modern warfare, such as UAVs, automized systems, but keeping the robustness. And to give you some example that most of the uh, enemies, uh, most of the armies in Europe are struggling with, I think, is to bring the uh, uh, legacy systems into the future, not overspending on the legacy systems, but uh, making them uh, valuable for the near future. I usually give the example that if we spend too much on today's tanks, we risk to have the most modern version of the equivalent of a Volvo four, of a Volvo 745 in 1930. A Volvo 745 that has never been more modern and more efficient, but at the same time, totally obsolete. So the direction I've given is not to spend more than to keep the systems alive and relevant, but to spend the money for the future. So these are some of my thoughts and the, the problems we are challenged is of growth. It means that we need to go from company-based international operations to brigade-based functions of war within 
rebuilding a division again. These are some of my thoughts that I give to you in this very short introduction speech. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and also, if possible, to show you some of the live fire that is soon to take place. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major General, for your um, opening speech. It was very insightful and I'm sure our audience liked it as well, especially from the, the location where you're at and doing an exercise. This is certainly a great opportunity. So thank you very much again for, for your time and for showing us a little bit of what is going on over there. What a better way to start our our webinar. Um, right now, before before we actually begin, um, I would like to tell everyone as a reminder that today's webinar on land forces modernization will serve to both discuss the topic among our guest speakers that have joined us and also to present the April issue of our magazine called Finable Times. Uh, so the structure of the webinar will be the following. Firstly, there will be um, a short presentation actually done by me on behalf of Finabel to introduce the topic and present you the next, the upcoming issue of Finabel Times, our magazine. Then we will continue with the presentations from our guest speakers, Mr. Ben Barry and Mr. Mark Essig. And then we will continue by having a panel discussion and we will end this webinar with a Q&A session. Now, during our panel discussion, I'm telling this especially if it's your first Finable webinar, during the panel discussion, our guest speakers will answer questions provided by our research team at Finable, whereas during the Q&A session, they will be answering questions coming directly from our audience, the questions that are being sent live during this live broadcast. Um, now, before I begin, I just have a little bit more of general information to give for our audience. First of all, uh, you can send questions uh, and comments at any time during the live broadcast using the chat function, which you find on the right bar, on the right part of your screen. Uh, this, this questions and comments will not be shown in, in the feed, so because we wouldn't want to disturb the, uh, the audience with the continuous flow of new comments coming in. But uh, don't worry and don't be shy because we have our admin behind the scenes who will be reading all comments and collecting questions for the Q&A session. So stay tuned until the end of the webinar to see your questions answered by our experts. The next thing is that for the first time, uh, there's the opportunity to request a certificate of attendance for this webinar. Uh, what, what do you need to do in order to receive this certificate who will be issued by us, Finabel? All you have to do is to stay tuned until the end of the webinar and we will be sending the link to fill in a survey. Now, this survey is very important for us. Uh, first of all, because we need to collect the data that we need to prepare your certificate and send it to you. And it will also be a satisfactory survey. Uh, therefore, it will help us improve for our future webinars and that, that's why it's of great value. For us. The last thing that I need to tell you is that should you be experiencing any technical issues or difficulties at any time during the live broadcast, meaning you can't see very well or you can't hear very well, uh, you all you have to do is click on the reconnect button, which you find at the top of your screen, and that will restore the connection for you. Okay, so we are now ready to start, and I will now share um, the slides for our Finable presentation. Okay, right here. Nice. So, um, therefore, I will gonna, I'm going to start by introducing you to our Finable Times magazine. Our magazine, which is called Finable Times, is a magazine specialized in European land forces, actualities, innovations, and modern constant and doctrines. Um, it addresses an international readership with a focus on Europe and it considers relevant questions on, on, at the academic, military, technological in, and industrial levels. And last but not least, it is supported by the 24 Finable member states, that is the armed forces of the European countries. What you see in this picture is are the covers of two previous issues of Finable Times. Uh, you might wonder, can I still read these magazines? Where can I find them? The answer is yes, you can still read uh, these magazines. You can find them on our website, uh, www.finable.org. Which brings me to my next point about the circulation and distribution of our Finable Times magazine. 
Uh, the magazine is shared on our social media accounts. Uh, we are on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram and YouTube as well. We share, we share our magazine there. So if you want to be notified of the latest issue, when it will be published, when it will be out and ready to be read, just don't forget to follow us on social media for that purpose. Um, but as I was saying, most importantly, our magazine is published on our website. Uh, www.finable.org. Uh, now, I strongly suggest you to check out this website, not just because of the magazine, but also because of our weekly publications. We have numerous publications going online every week, and especially info flashes and food for thought. Now, uh, if you're f if this is your first Finable webinar or you're not very familiar with Finable, uh, I will explain this to you a little bit. Info flashes are a sort of shorter publication in the style of a news article covering one of the latest news or developments that have happened in European defense and security. Uh, whereas Food for Thoughts are uh, a much longer publication in the style of a research paper that analyzes a certain topic and provides, again, an in-depth analysis and development of the concept as a whole. So I strongly suggest you to go on our website, finable.org, to be up to date with all these publications. Additionally, if you prefer receiving these publications in the comfort of your email inbox, there's also the possibility to, to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Uh, again, also from the website finable.org. Uh, let me just remind you that our website has more than 8,000 visitors, unique visitors, and more than 300,000 page views every single month. Now, as for our target audience, you can see the composition a little bit here in this slide. As you can see, the vast majority consists of uh, members of the Defence and Armed Forces and around a 10% comes from the world of the academia. Therefore, research institutes, think tanks, international organisations, etc. Uh, I have to say that the audience coming from our defense and armed forces landscape is very valuable to us because, as you know, FINABEL is run by the 24 commanders of the land forces of the European countries that are member states of FINABEL and they follow our work very closely. Now it is my pleasure to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of the April 2021 issue of Finable Times, uh, a little bit of an exclusive preview of the content that you will be able to find inside our magazine. First of all, we have interviews with uh, experts. Uh, you can see them here. First of all, uh, Major General Carl Engel Brexton, whom we just had the pleasure to uh, watch and listen to just a few minutes prior. Uh, next is Professor Peter Roberts from RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute. Uh, also, we have we will have Mr. Jean-Jacques Redé, uh, a member of the European Parliament and member of the National Defence and Armed Forces Commission. And last but not least, Mr. Mark Essig, who we also have here today as the guest speaker. You just saw him uh, a while ago. Again, uh, the, the magazine doesn't just end with interviews, so we'll find a lot more content, news article, in-depth analysis, uh, research papers and more that have been produced by our research and legal team at Finable. So as you can see, there's a lot of content that you just cannot miss. And to, again, to be notified of when the April issue will be out of the Finable magazine, just follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Instagram, and we are on YouTube as well for our video content. In order to, to make sure they're always up to date with our latest publications. Okay, now uh, moving on to the topic of the day, to the theme, the very own theme of this webinar, land forces modernization. First of all, what do we mean by land forces modernization? What we mean by that is uh, the process of changing the military equipment or doctrine of the land forces in order to find a way to face with new and changing scenarios. Now, I, as you know, the scenarios are constantly changing, constantly evolving. There are new threats emerging and arising uh, uh, every single day. Uh, therefore, the target has to be to increase the efficiency and the overall fitness for, in order to be able to face these new challenges. And of course, it has to rely heavily on technological advancements. Well, uh, a past paper has identified 
three of the main security challenges that modern land forces have to face. I have reported them here and we are briefly going to go uh, through them one by one to see what the situation is. Uh, first of all, we have unconventional warfare. As you might know, unconventional warfare is that sort of warfare that is fought through political resistance and a gradual build-up of resistance groups and forces as a response to a contested political structure. Now, unconventional warfare expects resistance groups to grow organically from a clandestine underground to auxiliary, to COVID auxiliary, then uh, moving on to overt guerrilla groups and eventually to mobile forces. Because it avoids battle and confrontation in its most classical sense, especially in its earlier phases, it means it becomes very difficult to the land forces to intervene early enough and in an efficient way to prevent the growth, the further growth of the resistant groups. In a similar manner, asymmetric warfare is the conflict between two or more parties where the force and the equipment diverge significantly. And just like unconventional warfare, irregular actions are are the norm and substitute the conventional confrontation, the conventional battle. The aim of asymmetric warfare is basically to reduce the effectiveness of conventional force. For these reasons, it is required to adopt strategies and tactics to deal with low intensity combat, uh, again, preventing Western land forces to be able to exploit and utilize their primary advantages. These conflicts, moreover, are usually conducted by non-state actors uh, uh, in hostile operational environments, which for Western forces can mean to can mean the fact that they can occur in expeditionary theaters such as Afghanistan or Mali, just to quote two of the most famous ones. However, unlike unconventional warfare, and this is one of the major differences between unconventional and asymmetric warfare, there is no growth or transition to a situation of parity of forces. Uh, and as such, it runs the, the risk of maintaining and perpetuating a situation of instability due to the fact of not being able to offer stability due to the weakness of one side. And finally, well, we have hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare combines a little bit of all of the above, therefore conventional, unconventional, cybernetic, asymmetric warfare to achieve military ends. This might represent one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge to land forces and militaries operating today. This is because rather than uh, using the traditional force on force confrontation, hybrid warfare shifts the attention to a trichotomy of troops, population and opponent. Now, both the U European Union and NATO have acknowledged the, the threat as the security threats generated by hybrid warfare and are developing different policies and strategies to counter them. However, as you can imagine, their focus is divergent in this sense. On one hand, we have the European Union, which is focusing on multidimensional hybrid operations, combining coercive and subversive measures. Whereas on the other hand, we have NATO focusing on hybrid threats by opponents who employ conventional and um, non-conventional means. Additionally, it has to be said that hybrid warfare is an excellent method of keeping the conflict below the level of traditional war. Thus, below that threshold that will require and trigger a response from traditional defense institutions and organizations such as NATO. This means that it makes it even more difficult to find appropriate responses to these new threats. Coming to the project, uh, I'm quoting here the Norwegian Armed Forces. They have recently stated that a challenging strategic environment constantly reminds us that we cannot take our freedom and security for granted. This means, and this highlights even more, that militaries have been and still are concerned with the fact of having to remain up to date and sort of catch up uh, in the light of recent emerging threats. Recent concerns have generated various security threats such as terrorism or drug trafficking or illegal immigrations or generally the dangers represented by non-democratic countries. Consequently, states and their armed forces must really improve how they choose to detect and fight these threats. And as a matter of fact, technology has to be an integral part of this process. Now, technology so far has been deeply integrated into the tools, 
and uh, functions and equipment of the different armed forces in order to increase the probability of favorable results. However, it's also prompting improvements and innovations by itself. Historically, militaries and their supporting industries have been pursued increased lethality of their systems. But there has to be awareness of the fact that lethality does not guarantee and does not equal to strategic effectiveness. And this effectiveness, at the end of the day, should be the, the ultimate goal of the modernization of the land forces. And it should be a holistic project, a project encompassing different components, and a process allowing the forces to be more effective at the end of the day. And a certain degree of technological and scientific development has to be included because it's so important to increase effectiveness. And yet, whilst a strong industrial base is important for this modernization processes, it is also essential to strengthen and emphasize the human dimension, uh, organizational factors, coordination, as well as adaptation to conflict environments, especially if they are hostile by definition. Now, in Europe, there have been several nations who have initiated ambitious projects to modernize their land forces. You can see a non-exhaustive list here of the countries. Um, these include Denmark, Finland, Greece, Hungary, the United Kingdom, France, uh, as more. What these projects have in common is the fact that they are not investing, not only are they investing in the traditional uh, trichotomy of ship, tanks and planes, so air, sea and land, but they're also heavily investing in cutting edge technology such as drones, artificial intelligence and cyber capabilities. Cyber capabilities are especially important and have to be optimized in order to obtain the best possible chance to respond to competition and these new challenges. These capabilities will enable the land forces to fulfill their role in maintaining security, as well as to preserve their freedom and independence in a world that is increasingly complicated and in a world where the, our opponents have become many, diffuse and irregular. Now, this is actually all from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found this very uh, little introductory presentation useful. Uh, if you haven't yet, again, I strongly suggest you to check our website, finable.org, and don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And last but not least, you can subscribe to our newsletter from our website, finable.org, to receive all the latest updates and publication in your email inbox. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. Now, uh, I would like to leave the floor to our first guest speaker, Mr. Ben Barry. Uh, thank you for turning the welcome back on. Uh, just a few words to introduce uh, yourself. Ben Barry is Senior Fellow for Land for Warfare at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. His areas of research and expertise include the higher management of defense, military innovation, uh, operations and tactics, adaptation, uh, as well as modern warfare. Uh, before joining IISS in 2010, he served in the British Army. He's a visiting professor at the Department of War Studies at King's College London as well, and has authored several publications. More recently, he's the author of the recent book, and I'm quoting the title here, Blood, metal and dust, how victory turned into defeat in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I will start sharing your presentation, Mr. Barry. Here it comes. Okay. And you have the floor. Thanks. Well, after um, your excellent introduction and the very uh, impressive briefing by the Swedish Army Chief, um, there's not much I ought to say, but I've got some perspectives on some aspects of land forces modernization. I must begin by saying that the IISS is not a British think tank. We're an international think tank uh, with offices in the US, Germany, uh, Bahrain, Delhi and Singapore um, and an international staff from 27 different nations. It just happens our headquarters is in um, London. Um, for those of you who are interested, yesterday the British Ministry of Defence announced a major modernisation of all its armed forces. Uh, and I'll send uh, Finnabel the links both to the Defence Command paper and also 
uh, for a very clear um, leaflet that the British Army has uh, put out. Uh, but I won't go into the detail now, except to say that many of the challenges um, the Swedish general identified um, certainly apply to the British Army, particularly the hard choice on how much you spend about current capabilities against investing in R&D for the future. If you don't mind, I'll just briefly plug uh, my new book that I published at the end of last year. Uh, the general was quite correct to say that there are aspects of the Iraq and Afghan wars that are not particularly relevant to future state on state or hybrid conflict. But one of my contentions is that there are actually many aspects of both wars that are relevant to current strategic circumstances. And two that particularly strike me are the five division US attack on Iraq in 2003. Um, which involved two core headquarters. And there's an awful lot of lessons come from that. And there are also many lessons from the very intense urban fighting, uh, for example, in Baghdad, Basra, and Fallujah. And I'm happy to be explore those in key questions. Um, I think the war in Iraq and Afghanistan does point to the, uh, point to the future. It also reminds us that war is unpredictable. The enemy has a vote and may fight to the death to cast it. It reminds us that war is a clash of wills between actors seeking to shape events to achieve their political aims. Uh, and the actors can include indigenous competence, intervening forces, and a blurring boundary between insurgents, militias, death squads, uh, organized crime, which I think we see in many complex co uh, conflicts in the world right, right now. Um, all the sides are, are seeking to, to I exploit their advantages and attrition, maneuver, symmetric and asymmetric military approaches and capabilities all had their, their roles. Uh, the conflicts also show the factors that Clausewitz identified as distinguishing war from other activities, the effects of danger, the difficulties of obtaining information, um, the summer heat, which Clausewitz would have described as exertion, and the pervasive president presence of friction, and the political nature of war right down to the tactical, tactical level. Um, and pervasive electronic and social media was used by all parties, accelerating the passage of information of various degrees of truth, rumor, falsehood and exaggeration. And if you want to think of it in terms of, 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 of books, uh, take Clausewitz, lay it on top of Hobbes, uh, Machiavelli, The Utility of Force by Rupert Smith, and then a box set of Games of Thrones and House of Cards, uh, shred them and put them into a powerful, powerful blender. Uh, some pointers from wars beyond um, 2014, uh, particularly Ukraine, Syria, Yemen, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, what's particularly interesting about Nagorno-Karabakh is it does show that state-on-state -state warfare uh, with quite a conventional component is still possible. Um, hybrid war, well, I think it's the comprehensive approach uh, being used by the bad guys, so it requires a comprehensive, comprehensive approach. And I think there are many lessons uh, from Iran's very successful hybrid and prop proxy war, uh, which we've studied in double I double S. Uh, clearly, there, uh, there are many parties are waging war by, through, and with allies on the ground. And there's a US model where you see um, security force advising troops and special forces uh, versus a model used by Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah in, in Syria. And what we've seen in all those wars is the importance of advisors on the ground. The air power provides asymmetric advantage, and that I think is the key lesson uh, about the fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh last year. The value of precision air weapons, but also the value of both precision and dull artillery, and the value of unmanned aerial systems in a wide variety of roles. Um, Combined arms warfare certainly isn't going out of fashion. And this picture here is some Iraqi troops at the end of the Battle of Mosul. And what were the capabilities that gave the Iraqi forces decisive advantage in Mosul as well as US advisors? It was infantry that moved in armored personnel carriers or armored Humvees. It was armored bulldozers, it was tanks. And it was also an eye in the sky in terms of manned and unmanned aircraft that was also able to apply precision net weapons. 
uh, the joint and combined arms team for the for the future. And at times this was integrated right down to platoon, platoon level. Um, what British General JFC Fuller called the constant tactical factor were improvements in capability, tactics or operational design are checked by a counter improvement by the other side. That's going to continue to apply. And I don't see any combined arms silver silver bullet. I think we have to recognise that land conflict is inherently combined arms joint and interagency and that new capabilities as they come forward will need to be integrated into this combined arms package. I mean, what use is cyber capabilities or expensive space capabilities if they can't actually make a decision to the leading company in the attack on the, on the ground? And this isn't a blue monopoly, it will apply to black, grey and white. Let me go on to some particular capabilities and issues. Ground. Geography and terrain is going to continue to influence, influence armies. This is a picture of Athens. It could be of any European city and many cities outside, outside Europe. Um, a word about urban operations. There's a global mega trend of urbanization where sometime in the last 10 years, more people in the world lived in urban areas than lived in open countryside. This means urban operations need to be seen as the new normal. And the silver bullet for that is combined arms joint capabil capabilities. Um, armies have to ask themselves, are they competent uh, in urban operations? And if they're not competent in urban operations, does it mean that they're actually incompetent? This also applies to Air Force and navies. Um, I note that I think all but two Finnabel uh, national members are members of NATO uh, and we all live in this common European home. So quite clearly uh, Russia and China and for European armies, particularly Russia, are a, a driving threat and they put a considerable investment into anti-access and aerial denial capabilities that will certainly limit the utility of fixed wing and rotary wing air power and providing offensive support to armed forces. Uh, they've made a considerable investment in armour, air defence and electronic warfare. And it's an inconvenient truth that the average Russian brigade has three times as much gun, mortar and rocket artillery than a NATO brigade. And it also has three times as much of its own ground-based air defence. And I do sometimes wonder if NATO armies are a bit in denial about about this because it, in my experience it will pro, prove it will pose considerable obstacles to NATO, NATO armies. Infantry have been the decisive capability in um, the wars after 9-11 and they're going to remain essential predominant they'll be the predominant arm in urban combat uh, and in complex terrain like woods and woods and forests. But infantry does require comprehensive modernization. In some respects, they remain the least modernized um, capability in modern, modern armies. Um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, their protection was greatly increased, but this greatly reduced their mo mobility. And they've not been as integrated into the digital network as, for example, armored vehicles, artillery, and, and aircraft. And I find it interesting that the kind of integrated soldier system that has often been advocated over the last 20 years still doesn't appear to have been effectively fielded and used on operations by any major major army. And it may be that the man-machine interface and battery technology is the limiting factor. I do think super soldiers are increasingly possible. A variety of approaches, personal implants, advanced performance enhancing drugs, and even genomic modification. Now, in Europe, legal factors and ethical factors may limit this, but other countries, including Russia and China, and indeed uh, non-state armed groups may be less inhibited. And I, I, I could quite see a scenario where the burgeoning esports industry or esports sector has players um, who've implanted technology inside, inside themselves so widespread adoption of any of these technologies by civilians could change attitudes. Of course, armoured vehicles still exist, and there's a lot of armoured vehicles in the world, over a quarter of a million armoured vehicle, armored vehicles in the world. And their combination of firepower, protection, mobility, 
means they'll continue to play a key role. Um, defensive aid suites, which are increasingly being fielded both by Russia, Israel, uh, the US and some NATO countries, uh, could have a disruptive effect on changing the armor anti armor balance. And in op open source uh, material, the only army that appears to have really woken up and smelt the coffee on this is Norway. Uh, quite clearly, tracks, tracked and wheeled armored vehicles will have different strengths and, strengths and weaknesses, uh, but many countries will continue to invest in wheeled armor as a result of its utility and low intensity operations. And we're going to see a wide variety of armored vehicle types and weights ensure, continue to endure. But we must remember that um, it's a combined arms team, not just tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. We're already seeing unmanned systems rapidly proliferating, in part benefiting uh, from work in the civilian sector, and that's a, uh, an armed UAV developed by ISIS. Uh, quite clearly, armies are going to require to put more effort into neutralizing uh, unmanned air, air vehicles. Unmanned ground vehicles will have an increasing utility. And I do wonder if NATO armies are behind the curve on this, particularly being behind the curve of the civil sector. And here's what I think is an inconvenient truth. IEDs aren't going to go away uh, and the technology will improve and proliferate. And landmines haven't gone away either as a cheap defensive weapon that can also benefit from add-on modern technology. So combat engineer capability is going to be increasingly important but increasingly challenged. But when I look at the data on European armies and their armored vehicle holdings and military balance, I do wonder that if the European armies are short of armored engineers, the exception uh, being the British, which have a very high ratio of armoured engineers uh, to armoured vehicles. And I think we're going to see directed energy weapons uh, proliferate. This is a Rheinmetall weapon demonstrated on a, a boxer vehicle. Um, they're going to have a utility for blinding sensors um, and helping with air defence and potentially counter indirect fire, provided you're not in an excessively humid atmosphere. But I think what we're likely to see is increasing application of the technology for radio frequency and non-nuclear EMP weapons. In ISS, we believe that non-nuclear EMP weapons already exist in the black program of some, some countries. Uh, they'll have a particular utility against HQs, but I think directed energy weapons are unlikely to be a silver bullet and would be best to be used in combination with other weapons. Okay, this slide is pretty self-evident. Um, you know, we've seen a massive increase in the capabilities of ISR systems. Uh, the difficulty is going to be prioritizing their application and coping with the volumes of data and getting the information to where it's needed. I think there's going to be an increasing difficulty in hiding land forces. Uh, not sure how many armies have woken up and smelt the coffee on that one. And indirect fire, I think, is going to become increasingly important. And the US, UK and NATO Army's artillery is outgunned and outranged by uh, Russian indirect fire. And what we could return to is the situation we were in in the uh, final part of the Second World War, where the majority uh, factor causing casualties was indirect fire, as opposed to IEDs, which pertained in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, people will need to look at the option for active defense against indirect fire. I think technology also creates new options for command and control. It's um, networking and countering network capabilities are going to be increasingly important, including old fashioned electronic warfare and jamming. Uh, command and control of urban operations is going to be especially challenging. And I think armies need to um, think for themselves how dependent they're going to be on the network. Can they afford to fight unplugged or fight dark? Or can they afford not to? Um, it's quite notable that in the UK Integrated Review and yesterday's Defence Command paper, there is much excellent language about the value of networking and the use of robotic and autonomous systems. Not once is the vulnerability of the network or the robotic system to electronic warfare mentioned. 
And I do wonder if you would use it, if, if despite all this, you could use technology to give you new models of command and control and new models of headquarters. Uh, finally, and there's a lot about this in uh, the Defence Command paper, British Defence Command paper, and the British Army brochure. But it seems to me there's some enduring historical lessons about how armies can engage the future, analysing lessons from wars, from operations and training, and learning from actual and potential allies and enemies. And if I were to identify a weakness of the learning exercise in the British Army, it doesn't seem to want to learn as much from bad guys as it does from its allies. Uh, armies need to be actively monitoring military and civilian science and technology but they mustn't be captured by the suppliers. And one impression I formed of, of the Swedish army is it benefits from a very, very close relationship with Swedish defence industry, which is in part an inheritance from national service. The same seems to apply to the Israeli army. Uh, armed forces should also be seeing fresh perspectives and challenge from the outside. Uh, in ISS, we sometimes help armed forces do this, uh, including the British army, but we'd like to do more. And then finally, armed forces should be experimenting. And this is where things are different from, say, the experimentation that was done by the British and Germans between the two world wars and armoured forces. Uh, synthetic environments, um, which of course have been developed mainly by the gaming industry, so the R&D has been funded by someone else. And the effects simulators, such as are used at the US National Training Centre, really do provide excellent new opportunities for experimentation uh, that weren't exploited during my uh, previous career in the British Army. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now end the presentation here. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I personally found it very insightful. Uh, right now, I would like to move on to Mr. Mark Essig, our second guest speaker. First of all, I would like to ask you to turn back on your webcam. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, now a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Mark Essig is an independent counsellor for the international development in defence and aerospace and used to be the chairman and CEO of Thales Ellis SA, country director for Greece, Cyprus and the Eastern Balkans. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience in the aerospace, defence, security and transport sector. He is an expert in the manager of international bids and projects in a complex strategic and political environment and has a deep understanding of the international uh, context and environment of the USA, uh, Northern Europe, Greece and the Eastern Balkans and East Africa. So now I will share your presentation, Mr. Essig. And whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. So um, I will so we'll talk about the land force modernization, but I will start by the, the European view. Uh, I am a true European believer, but I want to share the, this is known drawing showing that the, how complex is the organization with the various country, the various company, the various initiative and the various uh, alliance inside Europe and with the uh, US and the rest of the world. So it is quite complex, but useful in a way. And I think that, um, let's go to, to the next one, uh, with the, um, the EDF, which has been launched uh, in 2017, it's for me, at the industrial point of view, a key asset to start and increase the research for new system equipment for the land forces. But land forces alone will not work. You need also the air forces and the naval forces. The coordination between the three forces are essential to share all the situation awareness, to share the, the various equipment with the, to face the various threat, which are in the world today. So, the logic at the European Defence Fund has been put in place, money starts to be there, and agreement for research and cooperation between countries and uh, European defence companies are there to start the game and to build the next step. So, 
but where we stand. So uh, today, uh, what we can say is that um, the liberation degrees market in certain term is still at the state own, as we say it, uh, Sweden, France, uh, Spain, uh, uh, defense industry are still on the government, less on UK and so on, but still the government has a key, um, a key voice. Uh, what we can see also, there was a study made a few years ago to compare what the activity in terms of uh, and the equipment owned by the various forces in the in the Europe compared to US. And you can see that there is 20 type of uh, air sh uh, ships, four in, in US, one type of uh, ground vehicle more than 17 type of ground vehicles. So fighters, the same. So it's quite key to, to as the General Carl said, that um, to, to think about the next step and not to spend too much on the existing equipment, but prepare the future and also prepare the future together to build common platform that we can have the economy of scale and also to share the resources, to share the maintenance, to share the people and the equipment. It will not be easy, but I think this is the way to go to face all the, um, the threats which are in front of us. So I take a uh, few examples. So since the end of the Cold War, there was some uh, some uh, merge and acquisition and uh, and uh, creating big big player like EADS or now Airbus, Thales, MBDA, Finmechanica, the fail of having the EADS and BAE merge, but next the creation of KNDS with the merge of uh, KMW and Nexter to start and build some European champion. And I take two uh, major cooperation which are on the table right now for the coordination and uh, one is for the air and one is for the ground. The SCAF, you have heard that there is many uh, discussion right now. Uh, should it be, should it not be? Uh, discussion between France, Germany and Spain about the share, about the IPR, about the uh, about the the export control and so on. And, and for the ground, the MGCS with the next air and KMW with the newcomer of Rheinmetall, which also make a little bit more complex of discussion with the share of the activity and so on. So this is where we are. And what today, um, the constraint and limits about that. Uh, as I said, I am a truly European believer and for cooperation. And I think that uh, you can easily lost alone and win together, but the winning path is a little bit complicated. What has to be the limits and constraint is, for example, uh, recently the Ministry of uh, Danish Defense said that I want that the my Danish factory, my Danish company will work for the defense and produce and buying from the Danish equipment. That can be in extent, but not alone, need cooperation. So with this disfragmentation, it's a little hectic to do it. Uh, one other topic which is difficult right now is the um, control of exportation, the export control equipment. Today, every country has their sovereignty of that. There is not a European view of how you can authorize on unauthorized export of equipment, arms aboard. And sometimes when you some companies uh, provide the equipment, they don't know how they will use it as a second level or against whom uh, when they do when do an operation and so on. So this is one quite key challenging that we have to face. And 
I think that we need to find a way at European level to have a, uh, at least between European to have an export, an export control way which is common to all of us. The cooperation between countries need to be understand each other. One of the key issue is sometimes the cultural differences we have between French, German, British, Nordic. We don't behave the same and we don't think the same way to the next for, for how to organize the work and so on. And the last but not least is the concept of the operation. Uh, we don't have to build what we say in French, mouton à cinq pattes, uh, five legs ships because if we decide to to build one common equipment for several countries we cannot take all at technical level the uh, operational level all the requests from everybody because either the product will be too complex to use or will never come out because not re realizable so we need to to understand what are the different operational concept by the various forces and uh, and I take this example for the the Franco-German tank today the um, the concept of operation in France and in Germany are not totally the same so they don't they don't request the same type of equipment so to have a common equipment having two different type of um, of operation is not as easy to solve So, um, and just to uh, to uh, to to uh, summarize all of this, uh, let me show in a bigger way because I don't have it. So, for the public, we need to build what I say a balanced European industry base with the fair participation and fair share of spending. Um, it's what they try to find out with the SCAP project, for example. We need to have the access to the full EU market and not that someone go this way or the other way and so on. We need to have a commitment to assure local participation in order to have a return of investment for each of the companies to raise and promote the industry for cooperation. In terms of cooperation, we need to have the transatlantic, multinational and regional cooperation to assure the interoperability, which is quite key because more and more you need to react as a land force or air force or naval force to react quick and exchange situation awareness. The evolution of the situation which all the threat for the UAV, for the drones, for the for the various external uh, environment on which you need to react quick. So for that you need to have a very good interoperability. And for that we need to develop the new capability altogether. But in another in another way you need to assure the national autonomy, the national interest and to secure also the national uh, competencies. Everybody don't want to lose activity or to lose know-how and so on. At European level, if we can manage that, we will build a strong, powerful organization and would be interesting to establish what they have uh, at the US, the FMS, to have uh, to establish a European FMS which by European initiative with common European countries in order to secure and also have the economy of scale for all interoperability of the forces. But for that we need to rationalize our organization, reduce complex process and willing to win together. This is uh, the way I think industry can um, provide the best uh, equipment to the to the forces uh, uh, in the future that's uh that's my hand thank you okay thank you very much 
I have shared sharing, I stopped sharing your presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was highly appreciated. Actually, thank you for both of you really for joining us this afternoon and for your presentations. And now we are entering our panel discussion. Uh, therefore, uh, I will ask you questions coming from our research team at Finnable. Before we start, I need to ask you to uh, quickly turn your webcams back on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. And my first question is actually for Mr. Barry. Uh, and it, it is related to actually quite very recent news, uh, actually dating back to yesterday about the British Army. And it is the following. After the recent cuts that have been announced in trip numbers, tanks and urban fighting vehicles, do you believe this is going to undermine London's defence posture or instead the increased investment in cutting edge cyber capabilities are likely to offset them? The answer to both your questions is, is yes. One of the reasons they're cutting the sizes of troops is to be able to spend more money on research and development, of which there is a significant increase. They're also adopting a more experimental approach where when a capability goes out of service, they're going to run a program of experimentation to better understand what they, re they really need. Um, the British Army is probably the least modernised of the other of the three UK services. So I know they welcome the considerable amount of money that's being directed at them. And they have ambitions to really exploit the new technology. For example, by forming for their third division, a deep strike and reconnaissance brigade, something they actually uh, fielded on Operation Iraqi Freedom, but which combines armored reconnaissance, uh, long range precision firepower, electronic warfare and drones. Um, but they have decided to reduce their number of ground manoeuvre brigades in their heavy division from um, three armoured brigades to two heavy brigade combat, combat teams. So whilst I think their allies will greatly welcome the long overdue modernisation of the army, uh, the army is going to have some difficulty explaining um, how it's going to deliver equivalent capability with fewer units and formations. I see. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now moving to Mr. Essig. There is a quick question about the European Defence Fund, since you mentioned that in your presentation. And it is the following. Uh, what would you say is your opinion about the European Defence Fund? Do you believe it has been successful so far? And what are your expectations for the future after these four years of trial? It, uh, it was a long process, I will say. It, was, it has not been uh, really successful yet, but the EADP and the, the, the former small uh, iteration and initiative was quite, quite interesting and quite good. And uh, there is a willing to, to go further and to put more budget on the European Defence Fund, as I said. And I think this is one way and a very good way to invest for the R&D and for the new project, but only common. And this is the, the way the European Defence Fund will work. That means you need to cooperate between various countries and various industries in various countries. So that means the, the cooperation could be here. The projects are there. There is many, many projects for the future, for counter EAV, for uh, the artificial intelligence, for the land forces, uh, for the the new fighter, uh, the new fighter, uh, the new vehicles, and uh, some some new ships, submarine, and so on. So there is lots of needs for research, and one way with the EDF, there is the the bucket and the money for that to, to do. Now it's the willing for the country and companies to cooperate together. I think only, only time will tell, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, going back to uh, Mr. Barry, um, as a former high ranking officer and of course now a member of a highly renowned uh, international research organization such as IISS, what do you think the these bodies such as IISS or even Finnable or other research institutes should focus their efforts to be of greater use and utility to land forces? That's a very good, a very good question. I'm afraid I don't know enough 
enough about uh, Finnabel, so I, I wouldn't um, take your place. But I think what we can do is provide, what we certainly try to do is provide broad, broad, broad coverage of what's going on in war and security across the world. And that certainly enables people to learn about conflicts that they wouldn't otherwise uh, learn about. Uh, we've also got uh, 20 people who work full time analysing defence and military affairs, uh, mainly using open source, open source information. And one of the things we've done quite successfully for the British Army is to provide red team analysis to plans and ideas that they're coming up with. Uh, we also um, write scenarios. We've written a few for the uh, British Foreign Office and German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, which I can happily share with you. Um, we're able to produce independent unclassified scenarios, which I think people uh, could find quite useful to test their ideas against. Definitely, definitely. Yes, thank you. Um, back to Mr. Essig, I have a question that is very much focused on the industry side and yeah. it basically is who drives the equipment modernization in details? Is it the industries that create new products and which are then proposed and submitted to the armed forces or do manufacturers produce what the military are requesting for? I will say that it's a uh, it's, uh, complex answer but the um, the industry can build whatever the customer wants. After, as I said before, we don't need or we don't want to make uh, five leg ships because the, an army uh, want to have that, 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 and that, and that. And at the end, you will have something which is not usable or come too far and obsolete. So we need to, um, it's, a, it's a permanent dialogue between the industry and the the forces to build what are the necessary equipment they need for the certain activities in the frame time that they can have it and not obsolete because uh, if we build something um, f right now which is will be in operation in only 30 or 40 years it will be too late but more and more the, the defense part need to react more quicker than it used by the past, but also to 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 develop and propose some equipment on which there will be uh, a maintenance possibility, a maintenance accessibility in order that the equipment can have a longer life with some um, evolution or some uh, rerolls and so on, in order that to be adapted to the situation. I see. Okay, thank you. Actually, I have a follow-up question to my previous question, and it is: What are the main obstacles, if there are any obstacles, uh, that the industry encounters when it has to create some sort of product for the land forces? And if you've ever encountered certain military domains uh, in which you encounter some resistance to these innovations being implemented? As I as I mentioned, the 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 main constraint. Uh, uh, there is three three main constraints. Is the the first one is the IPR for cooperation in industry between different industry. Who owns the IPR of the product? Who can export it? And uh, linked to that, the export rules and the export control license. Where and how you can export the equipment or not? But at the first, there is the uh, political will to say, okay, I want to invest in Europe. And I want to invest with my companies in Europe and don't want to buy everything from a board or uh, a side and on, on which I will have very limited access or limited uh, power to update or maintain and so on. Okay. I see, I see, thank you. Uh, my next question is actually the last one for the panel discussion because I see we have a lot of incoming questions from our audience and uh, I would like to turn to that. So the, the last question for the panel discussion is actually addressed to uh, both of you. And it is not an easy one, I have to say, but it is what kind of impact do you believe COVID-19 is going to have in the modern modernization process in the future? Do you believe it's going to encourage the cooperation and interoperability among countries, or do you believe it's going to strengthen an even more nationalistic approach? 
um, I start maybe. Yes. I, I have a, a good example uh, of the impact of COVID. Uh, yesterday, I participated to a webinar with uh, General Marbeuf, which was the former head of the the EATC. Is one of the um, groups, seven countries. It's not NATO, not European, but it's the organization for air transport cooperation between these countries. And during the COVID, they used all the means about the these seven countries to transport more than 12,000 people which were sick of COVID all around the place in order to, to, to reharmonize with the, with the hospital and so on. So for me, the cooperation, the COVID will lead to a, hopefully more cooperation. It was a little bit hectic what we have seen with the European right now with the vaccine and so on, but I, I, I still believe that the, the European make the right choice to purchase all the vaccine all in one and not let the, each country doing by uh, what they want. It will have been a, a war between the countries to say uh, mm -hmm. I want the vaccine first and whatever and whatever. This is my, my, my view. I think the COVID hopefully will strengthen the cooperation. Right. Uh, I'm a fan of the EU and as a battalion commander and then a brigade commander in Bosnia, I saw the very positive effects on the security and stability of Bosnia uh, that arose from the EU investment in Bosnia, for example, in assisting with police, police reform. Um, and I certainly didn't support Brexit, but it certainly seems that COVID has brought nationalism back. It's brought borders back. Uh, I'm also afraid that the reputation for competence of Brussels or the, uh, the European Commission has been badly damaged. And um, the, the EU right, rightly has considerable ambitions to be more of a security and defence actor. Well, if, it, if in security and defence uh, its competence um, was of the same low level as the vaccine, then Europe has a big, big problem. I think there's two other aspects. I think uh, armed forces have been used across Europe in some similar ways, but also in different ways, depending on legislation, constitutions and the role of the armed forces. But the armed force considered contribution to national resilience, homeland defence and major civil emergencies, such as, for example, an unconstrained state sponsored cyber attack. I think we're going to see more of that. I think, though, there is a, an uncomfortable military implication of COVID. Um, and there's also a comfortable one. Let's start with a comfortable one. The RNA vaccines that have been developed are as a result of genetic modification technology. And I've been vaccinated in a way that has genetically modified some of my own cells. So objections to genetic modification to improve the performance of military personnel I think uh, may well reduce as these new vaccines roll out. But I think the dark side is this genetic manipulation technology, um, which is out of the bottle, it's, it's freely available on the internet. Uh, that will be very attractive to malign actors, both states and non-state armed groups, and the importance of defense against uh, biological weapons, both for whole societies and for militaries. And, uh, but particularly military units that do CBRN defence, I think their importance will all go up. Right. I think we can just hope that cooperation will be the desired outcome, not only in the military, but in many other domains related to this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I guess even for this one, Oli, time will tell. Um, OK, thank you very much for your for your answers. Uh, right now, we are going to start the Q&A session where I will be just the voice and I'll be asking you questions coming from our audience who has been joining us uh, for this for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for having hanging in there and being with us this this whole time. The first question is actually addressed to uh, both of you again. And it is the following from your uh, professional experience and perspective. Which one do you think is more relevant and easily accessible way of defending a country from an opponent's 
um, from an opponent in general. Uh, the integration of the land forces into the other systems, air, sea, cyber even, or just being entirely focused on the modernizations of the land forces. Um, Who would like to go first? Well, my personal view is you, you definitely need both. And I'll give you an example of this. At times in Helmand province, British troops were besieged by large numbers of Taliban fighters. And also in Eastern Afghanistan, the same happened to US forces where platoons or companies were surrounded and there was desperate hand-to-hand, -hand, there was desperate battles uh, with very brave attacks by brave and well-led Taliban fighters. But the thing that presented, prevented these outposts from falling was fire support from both precision and ordinary artillery, and particularly from manned and unmanned aircraft. Now, no NATO base fell in Afghanistan, and it was air land integration held together by satellite communications that en enabled that. Uh, you've got to have joint force integration, in my view. I, I agree with Ben. It's, um, you, you need to have a joint, a joint integration forces because uh, uh, everyone need to see what I said, uh, what we I call the situation awareness. Uh, everybody need to know what's happening in the air, on the ground, and on and under the sea, because the threat can come from everywhere, and you need the support of the, of the others to fight against the like like in with the Taliban, like in Iraq, like uh, on the um, on the sea with the pirates and so on. So you need to you need to cooperation both. Yeah. And could I just add one point, which I think is relevant to a lot of Finnabel members. This is where small is beautiful. Because where you've got a country with small armed forces, uh, people from the three armed forces, particularly the officer corps, can get to know each other much better than in large armed forces. Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, my next question um, it was originally addressed from Mr. Essek, but actually I would like to hear both of your opinions on this one as well. Um, it is the following. How important is it for European countries to play a role in pushing for new treaties to codify the use of weapons, uh, such for example uh, drones? Since it was mentioned that European countries may likely end up behind on some technology, such as the super soldiers or some other equipment, do you believe that Europe should not only uh, should push for a greater codification of these? I think this one is interesting because we're sort of stepping into the ethics and legal implications uh, that UAVs uh, and drones imply. Uh, I think so. The the EU needs to um, and need to to be on head of that, and uh, there is a big debate uh, related to artificial intelligence and uh, what we call the the unhuman soldier or the artificial soldier who can uh, take his own decision. For me, we have the, um, we, we reach the, the, the ethic and the, the border of the, of the human and we don't need to, to go above that. And we need to have to, to put some, some rules and limit the, um, limit the use of the artificial intelligence up to a certain point which is acceptable by the the people we cannot uh, we cannot make a machine decide to kill or not to kill mm -hmm. by itself uh, this is an area of great interest yeah. to iiss traditionally we've done a lot of work on arms control and one of the things we try to promote to, from our own work particularly on the military balance is trans transparency and open source information uh, has revolutionized the way we do this. Uh, we must remember what are the principles of the laws of armed conflict as in the five Geneva Conventions? Uh, their necessity, proportionality and discrimination. And remember also a war crime can only be, be proven uh, when someone is found guilty in a properly constituted court. Uh, far too many countries and organizations allege war crimes uh, for events that quite clearly are not war crimes under an international human humanitarian law. But the moral, legal and ethical dimension of modern conflict is absolutely vital. Nothing did war, for example, to destroy the US's credibility in Iraq 
uh, than the prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib. Um, so all weapon, all new weapons and all new capabilities um, need to be tested against uh, the law of the law of armed conflict. And I think it's very important that international organizations and um, independent think tanks and indeed bodies like Finnebel um, promote a, deba a debate on this. I would add, though, when countries opt out of particular weapon systems for moral, legal and ethical reasons, if that particular capability is available in civilian technology, for example, implants for computer gamers, um, and the absence of that technology, say armed drones, for example, results in your own troops being at a disadvantage or killed, uh, the public political and media view can change extremely quickly because there'd be angry voters who say, well, my son or my uncle was killed because we chose not to, uh, say, have um, armed drones or directed energy, directed energy weapons. And that's a real balance of judgment and risk for the leadership of armed forces and defence ministries uh, to really think on long and hard. Right, yeah, I believe this is definitely one of the hottest topics uh, in this. There are a lot of this being said uh, about this legal and, and ethical implications. And as you said, even us at Finnable, we've been producing some papers and info flashes in this specific topic because it's honestly so interesting and there's so much that still needs to be discussed. So thank you again. Um, next question is uh, for Mr. Essig. And it is the following. Uh, would you agree or disagree with the statement that the ministries of defense are a little bit disconnected or detached from the markets and businesses? I think what is meant here by markets and businesses are the, the industries producing any sort of military equipment or innovation. I will say it depends of the Ministry of Defense, but okay. generally the, <laughs> the Minister of Defense is a political guy. And mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. he has to act as a politician and maybe not follow what the armed force or the brigadier general or the 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 chief of staff uh, will decide. We have okay. seen in in various countries uh, sometimes disagreement between the the defense force and the government because the the willing of the politician was not what the willing of the defense force want, but. I suspect that uh, it start to be less and less disconnected because the the, politi the political cannot put aside the willing of the people who will make the defense and who will support the country. So mm -hmm. more and more they they are, um, they are uh, listening what they what they thought. Right. But okay. After you cannot. You cannot uh, avoid the political alliance to say that, for example, uh, the ministry, uh, ministry of Defense decide, uh, I will purchase this equipment. The defense can say, no, it's not the one I have a sponsor because it's not the one I want. But the, Def the Ministry of Defense say, you have to buy this because it's a deal I made, point. This, I hope it will be less and less in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, thank you. Um, next, I have a question for Mr. Barry. Um, what would you see as the main challenges uh, facing operational and tactical delivery of logistics on the Article 5 battle space? Well, I think the challenge was well referred to by um, the Swedish Army Chief. Uh, we're into an a, a, into a battle space where there's a considerable threat from enemy air and in enemy indirect fire. Um, there may also be a threat from special forces and proxy forces. So one of the things I think European armies had to adapt to in Iraq and Afghanistan was this 360 degree uh, battle space, the vulnerability, for example, of logistic convoys. And I think they adapted to it very well. There were gallantry medals. Uh, won by uh, logistic convoy dri drivers, including a significant proportion of, of women, for example, and by um, maintenance mecha mechanics repairing armoured vehicles un under fire. Um, so it's the 360 degree and the um, and the air and indirect fire threat as well. 
I think um, the other point is that uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, coalition forces had unhindered access to the electromagnetic spectrum by and large, and were able to use increasingly industrial quantities of secure bandwidth. I think, um, and they're able to admit as much as they want. Uh, do that, I think, on the NATO Article 5 battlefield, and your logistic convoys are going to get comprehensively attacked and shelled. So operating under a hostile electronic battlefield. And I should say, um, on all the British Army NATO exercises I went on, including core level exercises in the 1980s, and indeed in British Army post-Cold War training, uh, the use of electronic warfare and jamming was very carefully controlled. Uh, so it didn't stop the exercise and also it didn't spill over into civilian frequencies. As a young officer, uh, my battal when I was a young officer, the battalion I was in was seriously jammed for a day by the Chinese army. And it was an eye-watering experience that I've never uh, forgotten. Um, so hostile electronic warfare and also uh, hostile signals intelligence also needs to be something that's um, managed in exercises. All this is simulatable in exercises, uh, provided the armies actually take the trouble to take all their logistic uh, units on exercise with them. Very heartening to see the ammunition being delivered to the Swedish artillery uh, this afternoon. Right, right. Thank you. Um, for my next question, I would like to hear um, both your opinions. Uh, just starting from Mr. Barry, because by chance it was something that we were briefly discussing before we went live today, and it has to do with one of the elephants in the room, of course, climate change. Uh, the question for our, from our audience is, how can climate change adaptation be built into military modernization uh, beyond the most common uh, ways in which that we can think of, such as fuel, uh, the, the re reducing the fuel consumption? Well, this is a really good question that's close to my heart because I'm doing work on it from IISS. I think we first need to recognize that uh, climate change has become the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. Wherever there's security and human security challenges, it's going to make things worse. And it's a potential driver of conflict. For example, water conflict between India and Pakistan. And right now it's making things worse in the Sahel and the Horn, the Horn of Africa. Um, this is well recognized by um, the US, um, you know, who had the, the, the Pentagon had the difficult position that Trump and his government were climate change deniers, but they recognize the, the, the climate change exacerbates conflict. And uh, President Biden has set out an ambitious plan for the US to move to net zero. And he's charged uh, Secretary Austin with making this work for the, pen, the Pentagon. Um, France has been doing work on it, and there's been excellent work, all of which is publicly available, done by New Zealand. Uh, I produced a, an ISS blog on this, which I'll, I'll link you to afterwards. Um, but quite clearly, re removing the emissions from military equipment, uh, the carbon emissions, while sustaining capability is a bit of a challenge. Uh, the good news is that civilian industry is well on this. The aerospace industry is on it. Um, the automotive vehicle and truck industries on it, um, you know, smart electricity, smart power. And we're going to see a major announcement, I think, by the UK early next next week um, about their strategy, which is very ambitious um, and it's thoroughly supported by the armed forces. Um, and the Royal Air Force, for example, aims to be at net zero by 2040. And uh, one of the things in the new defence command, command paper was a real desire uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of the British Armed Forces. Now, some things are going to be very easily adapted to reduce the command footprint, but some other things uh, like fighter jets and like tanks, there's probably going to be a limit to how far that can be that can be done. So mm -hmm. one thing armed forces need to be looking at is how they can uh, produce their own energy and particularly how they can do carbon capture, making use of their large bases and training areas. But I, th I think, um, you know, I'm very encouraged by President Biden and Secretary Austin's uh, public statements. I'm really encouraged by New Zealand. And I think we're going to see quite a leading role assumed by the UK. And I think it'd be really helpful if at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the defence and security implications of climate change were on the agenda. 
Right. Uh, I, I join uh, what Ben said, and in fact, uh, the good thing of the COVID, I will say, is that accelerate the transformation of uh, aerospace industry uh, with the the lot of initiative and uh, for the hydrogen air, aircraft for the mobility uh, car mobility or uh, helicopter three of uh, free of pilots and so on so it has foster and uh, accelerate the the process of uh, design and developing new strategy but i agree for the um, i don't think we can see a uh, uh, a fighter or a tank uh, vehicle which has been uh, hydrogen based it will not be right now the i think a possibility and uh, and the, the army needs to find uh, some other way to, to produce uh, to produce energy in order for them to to continue but i and, but I really hope that the, with the change on the aerospace and the civilian, it will bring added value for the defense. Generally, it's the defense who bring uh, uh, new technology to, to the civilian. Uh, with this COVID story, I think the acceleration of the change in the aerospace industry will bring, uh, will bring new technology from civilian to defense. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much for both your answers. Um, speaking of climate change, Finnebel has some recent publications that are quite interesting uh, while dealing on the topic. Can I just so again, say they're, they're rather good. <laughs> thank you. They'll be very much appreciated. Uh, I know much of our research team is watching us right now, so I'm very sure they will appreciate this. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, once again, um, another reason to check our website, finable.org, for these info flashes and fruitful thoughts. Now, I would like to really continue and ask you questions and hear your answer all afternoon long. However, I've just taken a look at the clock and I have to say we're running uh, a bit short of time. So I would like to thank you both of you very much for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. Uh, your presentations have been marvelous, very interesting and insightful, and I'm sure our audience uh, has enjoyed them as well. So personally, what I can say is to thank you very much really for, for joining me and for providing us with a little bit of your knowledge and expertise and experience. Uh, again, thank you very much to uh, Finnable. Personally, I'd like to thank Finnable for the opportunity given to me to, to host this, to, this webinar and be here today. Uh, thank you for the Finnable teams that have made this webinar possible. Uh, last but not least, thank you very much to our audience for being here, to all the participants that have been followed us for more than one hour and a half at this point. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I would just like to remind you that, again, if you would like to obtain a certificate of attendance, you can do so. Uh, just uh, we'll, we'll be sharing the link right now to fill in this survey, this, this survey that will be very useful for us to both uh, have a have an idea of whether you liked our webinar and how we can improve in the future and of course for us to collect the information that is needed for the um, just to prepare and send you the certificate so i'm going to share it right now with everyone okay you should receive a notification right now and then of course uh, this link will be sent to will be uh, on our social media and will be sent to you as well if you have attended. So uh, again, thank you very much everyone for joining us. It was it was an absolute pleasure for me. Uh, one special thank again to Mr. Ben Barry and Mr. Mark Essick for joining us as again to Major General Carl Engel Braxton for his, for his opening speech and from the location that he was being at and during the exercise. So have a nice rest of the day. Goodbye from me. Uh, I'm Anarita and from Finnebo. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.